December 13, 1970. The five members of Jethro Tull walk into Island Records' newly revamped studio on Basing Street in London. Today, they'll record three songs for their upcoming fourth album, Aqualung. But beyond that, they'll run into a host of unexpected new problems over the next two months of sessions that will affect the quality of this record and its subsequent re-releases for the next four decades. My name is Mike from Ruling Out Music, and today, we're going to see how digital technology saved one of the most important progressive rock records in history. The Aqualung album for some time now has been a source of controversy on multiple fronts. First, its pro-God anti-church stance helped it suffer a huge backlash in some of the more religiously oriented places like the Bible Belt of North America. Church organizations hosted ritual burnings of the album. But when the lead single is called Hymn 43 and it's about bastardizing a religious idol for personal self-righteousness, you're probably going to see some heat for that. I mean, this song is like song four on side B of this record and everyone gets straight kicked in the face with it right out the gate as a single. Ian, slow down, bro. You got to ease him into it. That aside, the album still hit number four in the UK and number seven on Billboard in the States. Although now that I think about it, those ritual burnings probably required album sales. So early viral marketing, I guess. Maybe he knew what he was doing. But the other controversy is the sonic quality of the album. Don't get me wrong, I love this album. It's one of my favorite albums ever made. But every time I listened to it, I always had to get through the fact that it kind of sounded like a demo tape. It's distorted and muffled in certain parts, and you can hear instruments fighting over each other, especially in the louder tracks. So I cracked up in the internet to see what I could find on this matter. And there were quite a few things that really kind of stopped this album from seeing its full sonic potential for a very long time. First, the recording studio they used, Island Studios, was converted from an old church, and it had been freshly revamped with brand new equipment, a lot of which the studio engineers weren't all that familiar with yet, so the band became someone of a guinea pig in that regard. This building also had a couple separate studios to use as well. Jethro Tull ended up with the less coveted larger studio, which, due to its size, was hard to control on top of all the new equipment. This really doubled the learning curve for them and affected quite a bit. But what about the other studio? What was that like? Well, it turns out it was much more manageable to use, but somebody else already kind of had dibs on it. That somebody else was Led Zeppelin, who was in the same building at the same time recording what would ultimately become Led Zeppelin 4. So that kind of left Jethro Tull a little stuck. However, in April 1971, Aqualung was released, and regardless of said technical issues, became a cornerstone for progressive rock for decades. But the story obviously doesn't stop there. In 1996, as most iconic bands eventually do with their biggest records, Jethro Tull released its 25th anniversary remastered edition of Aqualung. But even with the introduction of the technical advancement of the day, the album still suffered from many of those problems from the original recording sessions. Actually, at some point, the stereo tapes were lost and they almost had to remaster the album from a vinyl copy. But the tapes were eventually recovered and the release went out as planned, bonus tracks and all. However, even with the technological improvements available, the album still felt like something was missing. As much as I loved it, I ended up picking up an officially released live BBC recording from 2005 that told release of the entire album being played front to back just for the sonic clarity. It just goes to show you that sometimes you just have to accept that some things can't be fixed. Or can they? In 2010, enter Stephen Wilson, at this point most well known as lead vocalist and guitarist for the progressive rock band Porcupine Tree. With a storied background as a songwriter, musician, and meticulously attentive producer, Wilson had just finished a project with another iconic progressive rock band, King Crimson. This was a controversial task that was rising in popularity. Transferring the original 8-track analog session tape recordings of King Crimson's 1969 debut album, In the Court of the Crimson King, to digital format and completely remixing it from the ground up. This is way more ambitious than the standard stereo remasters that tend to be done on a regular basis. And apparently, the quality, according to reviews and fan feedback, is nothing short of remarkable when it's done right. So, Jethro Tull's label, Chrysalis Records, and frontman Ian Anderson decided to take a small leap of faith and see what Wilson could do with their original multi-track session tapes, which they still had. Wilson brought the tapes to Abbey Road Studios and transferred them to digital at 24-bit, 96 kilohertz quality. From there, he mixed the tracks in Logic version 9.1.4 and took full advantage of the technology available to him, including a better mixing environment and digital versions of high-end analog equipment that was unavailable to the band during the original sessions. His purpose was to help balance and clear all the mud from the original release mixes and restore all the missing pieces that were lost technology available at the time. And on the way, make sure that the feel and familiarity of the original album wasn't lost to new tech. The Aqualung 40th Anniversary Edition released on October 31st, 2011. It did see a few different versions with special bonus tracks and liner notes, but the version that I have is the 2015 Straight Ahead CD version. This one's mastered by Peter Mew at Abbey Road, but in 2016, there was another release that was remastered by Stephen Wilson himself, as he wasn't too fond of Mew's finished product. I'll be sure to find that one and snatch it up when I get the opportunity. So, the million dollar question. Does this new release sound better than the original? 
I guess that comes down to your opinion of what the hell am I saying? This thing sounds amazing. It's the one I've been waiting for for decades. Even if you have an original, go get this one right now. It's get the 2016 version. It's stupid how good this thing sounds. So what's your opinion of the 40th anniversary release of Aqualung? Please comment below. If you liked the video, please click like and subscribe for more videos as well. Thanks for watching. And again, this is Mike from Ruling Note Music reminding you to never compromise your sound.